interviews with business owners that puts them in front of a global audience. And in behind those shows is a whole range of things, from digital magazines, to social media, to blogging, to email, to lead generation, just a whole range of things. Welcome back to the Everyday Business Show. I'm your host, Tony Lontis, and this week we have another inspiring guest to chat to today. But before we do that, just a reminder, if you're watching this live on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, don't forget to give us a comment, reach out and say hi, and let us know you're there. If you miss any of these shows, please jump on to any of our platforms, including Binge Networks USA, Hero Go, the Tony TV channel app, Zondra TV Networks, and of course, smart TVs across the globe, including LG, Roku, and Samsung. Now, we love to hear from you, so please reach out. A reminder too that anything we talk about in the show today, including our amazing guests, information and giveaways, please know that those will be attached in the notes that go with the show. Now, each and every week, we do an important acknowledgement to the special part um, that our Indigenous communities play in the development of our country's identity. So today, I want to respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugamba language region, the traditional owners of the land on which we broadcast, and I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening and watching today. Now, before I introduce you to Terry Tucker, here's what you need to know. Terry is a motivational speaker, an author, an international podcast guest on topics of mindset, motivation, and self-development. He is the founder of Motivational Check LLC, and he's been a college basketball player, a marketing executive, a hospital administrator, a what... (laughs) A what? A SWAT team hostage negotiator. How cool is that? A high school basketball coach and a business owner, motivational speaker, and most recently, a cancer warrior. He is the author of the book, Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And the developer of the Sustainable Excellence Membership. Terry is also featured in Authority, Thrive Global, and Human Capital Leadership magazines. Welcome to the show, Terry. Well, thank you, Tony. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. I'm delighted you could take the time out of your busy day to connect with us on the show. Um, First of all, I just want to tap on something that I find very interesting in your bio, and that is SWAT negotiator. Before we start, can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Usually your next door neighbor is not a SWAT team hostage negotiator. So, Nope, um, that's correct. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I felt it was very productive, very good work trying to help other people. Um, for those of you that don't know who, uh, how SWAT is organized, there's usually mm-hmm. two components to it. One is a tactical team and yes. one are the negotiators. And the tactical team are the, the officers with all the, the toys and the guns and things like that. And the negotiators are the ones that if we do our job, the tactical team doesn't get to use all their toys and things Ooh. like that. <laughs> so so it's, it's very much dealing with people in crisis, people who have um, made bad decisions, have, have maybe taken a hostage, maybe barricaded themselves with a weapon. Uh, maybe they're a wanted person that we get a tip on that they're yes. they're held up in an apartment or a house or something like that. And it's our job to do everything we can to get them and the hostages out right. safely. So that's really the goal. And, and there's a lot of uh, you know psychology behind it. We work with the psychologist, we train with the psychologist, and we do this as a team. It's not an individual kind of thing. And so, you know, our job is to basically go in, try to understand why we're there, 
try to use open-ended questions to get the person to burn off a lot of their emotional energy yeah. and then get to the point where they're using their rational brain. And it's at that point that we can talk about solutions coming out, letting the hostages mm -hmm. go and things like that. And about 90% of the time we were successful in what oh, we did, right. but about 10% of the time, the person made the choice that they weren't going back to jail or they weren't going back to prison yeah. and they chose yeah. to end their life. And while that's always tragic, I don't mean to sound callous about this, but I never lost any decision. sleep over it. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it was their decision. I knew I did everything I could to try to get them out safely. Yeah. Terry, thank you for sharing that insight with us. Now, before I get started on the amazing work that you do now, can you take us on a bit of a journey through your life? Sure. So I was born and raised uh, in Chicago, the third largest city here in the United States. You can't tell this from looking at me or from my voice, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And wow. as you mentioned, I, I know <laughs> I, I was a I was a college basketball player. I was fortunate enough to go to college on a basketball scholarship. When I graduated from college, I moved home to find a job. I'm, I'm really going to date myself now, but this is long before the Internet was available to help people That's find. Okay. We're a great generation, Terry. Exactly. <laughs> To find people, uh, to help people find employment. And I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. And so I'm looking for that first job. Fortunately, I found it in the corporate headquarters in the marketing department of Wendy's International, the hamburger oh, yes. chain. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, I live with my parents for the next three and a half years as I help my mother <laughs> care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different forms. Oh, Terry. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, that's life. It is, that, that is life. That's, yes. That's the way things go. Um, as you mentioned, started out at Wendy's. Uh, then I moved to hospital administration. And then I made that major pivot in my life and became a police officer. And as we talked about, I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. Oh, okay, as part so that's of that. how that fits in. Yeah, so that's how that fits in. Once my law enforcement career was over, I started a school security consulting business coach girls high school basketball, made the brilliant business decision to start a motivational speaking business right as COVID hit. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, in 2020. But for the last 10, actually almost 11 years now, I've been dealing with a rare form of cancer. And then I guess just finally, my wife and I have been married for 30 years. We have one child, a daughter, who's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is an wow. officer in the new branch of the military we have here in the United States, the yes. Space Force. Yes. Wow, that's cool. Very We're cool. Very Terry, can I ask a little bit about the cancer for the audience? It's a tough, um, as the audience knows, I've got a nursing background. This is a tough topic, tough conversation. Are you happy to share a little bit of that with the audience, Terry? Sure, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to. Um, Back in 2012, I was coaching girls high school basketball and I had a callus break open on the bottom of my foot. Initially didn't think much of it because as a coach, you're on your feet a lot. Yeah. But after a few weeks of it not healing, I went to see a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine, mm -hmm. took an x-ray. He said, Terry, I think you have a little cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And, you know, showed it to me, little gelatin sack with some yes. white fat in it, no dark spots, yeah. no blood, nothing that gave either one of us concern. Yeah. But- Fortunately or unfortunately, he sent it off to pathology. Two weeks later, I get the call from him. And as I mentioned, he's a friend. And the more difficulty he's having explaining to me what's going on, the more frightened I am becoming until oh. finally he just laid it out for me. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years. I have never seen the form of cancer that you have. You have an incredibly rare form of melanoma. And most people think of melanoma as, you know, too much exposure to the sun and it affects the melon in our skin mm. or, or the pigment in our skin. He said, mm. this has nothing to do with that, but it is melanoma. It appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And that started my odyssey. At the time, melanoma was a death sentence. So they yes. put me on a drug called interferon, yes. uh, which you may be familiar with. Yes. The side effects of the interferon were that it gave me severe flu-like symptoms for two to three mm. days every week after each injection. Mm -hmm. And I took those weekly injections for five years. 
So imagine having the flu mm. every week for five, five years. years. That's yeah. not great. And, and that was not a cure. That was as my oncologist said, we're trying to kick the can down the road. Yeah. Uh, eventually, but the drug became too toxic. I had to stop it. And yes. almost immediately, the cancer came back in the exact same spot on my foot. That necessitated the amputation of my left foot in 2018, two more mm. surgeries in 2019, and then in 2020, an undiagnosed tumor kind of in my ankle area grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone, and my only recourse right in the middle of the pandemic was to have my left leg amputated, uh, and I also found out I had tumors in my lungs, which I am still currently being treated for. And Tony, I know that sounds like a really ugly and dark journey, and it certainly has been, but I'll tell you, there's a couple things I've learned. First of all, I don't think you really know yourself until you've been tested by some form of adversity. And secondly, I really believe cancer has made me a better human being. There are those those elements um, when we're faced with, with adversity that oftentimes make us a better human terry thank you for sharing that that journey um i also recognize that the phenomenal leaps in um in medical science around cancer treatment are just happening at such a rapid rapid rate and my belief is that the answer to a lot of the cancers that we as humans suffer suffer is out there and will be developed for humanity as we go forward so thank you for sharing that with us terry i really appreciate it um i'm also thinking about your height at six foot eight so for the audience i'm five foot two i'm like a dwarf and i'm thinking about six foot eight and going wow that would have been a scary height as a police officer i bet they loved you yeah. well my my i had a, a partner who's uh who I was in the same academy with and her dad used to always tell her that when the shooting starts, you hide behind Terry, you know? So, <laughs> so we, we kind of joke about that even to this day. Yeah. 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 Terry, with all of that knowledge on board, can you describe to the audience what you see as your life purpose? You know, Tony, I really think my life purpose has evolved over over the course of my life. I think when I was young, I, I mean, I was I was so into sports, so into athletics um, that I literally ate, drank and slept basketball. And, and I really yes. felt at that point in my life, it was my purpose. As I became an adult, uh, my grandfather was a Chicago police officer from 1924 uh -huh. to 1954. And yeah. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. But my dad was absolutely not. You're going to go to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get out, get a great job, get married, have 2.4 kids to live happily ever after. Yeah. But that's what my father wanted. And so yeah. when I graduated from college, I had a choice. I could have said, gee, dad, I know you're dying, but I'm going to go off and blaze my own trail. Or out of love and respect for you, I will do what you want me to do. So I ended up yeah. My resume makes a little bit more sense now because yes. I, I went into business because that's what yes. my dad wanted me to do. And mm -hmm. I sort of joke, I, I did what every good son did. I waited till my father passed away and, and, and I followed my own dreams. Mm -hmm. So I got into law enforcement kind of late in life, but I felt it was my passion, my purpose, my mm -hmm. why, whatever you want to yeah. call it. Yeah. And now, as I'm in all honesty, probably coming to the end of my life, I really feel now that my purpose is to put as much goodness, positivity, motivation, inspiration, love back into the world as I possibly can with whatever time I have left. So I think my purpose has evolved over the course of my life. Yeah. Terry, of all those wonderful and diverse collection of roles you've done, what's your favorite? Oh, without a doubt, being a police officer. And, and I know that's not really... Uh, a politically correct thing to say these days, you know. There, I just been so, so, Terry. Here's here's the thing: we need police officers. We need people who are passionate about law-abiding citizens and protecting law-abiding citizens. The world doesn't work so well without police officers. So I'm a little reluctant to pile on to a lot of the current thoughts around 
the policing establishment. Um, and as you know, nurses and police have a pretty close association. I know, dealt with many of the finest police in, in my time in nursing. So I, I actually think that people need to stop and think someone has to do that job. It's an incredibly thankless job. And I don't think that many police officers deserve the rhetoric that comes their way um and i don't think it's helpful as a society um i would agree with you I, yeah I, I think that people you know if you get into that line of work to sort of uh you know take names and kick butt so to speak as we used to say you're in the wrong profession because that's yeah. absolutely not why you should get in that that business because eventually you're going to run across somebody that's bigger stronger and faster than you oh, and you're yeah. going to get hurt and you're going to get somebody else hurt but if you go into that profession trying to make a difference trying to make a positive impact on your community then it's an entirely different story and i think you always have to remember that I, I always used to use the example that, you know, I might pull you over one night, you know, for running a stop sign or for speeding. And for you, that may be the scariest thing that happens to you all year. For me, it's the second traffic stop of the night. So yeah. you, you have yes. to understand that there, there, there are those fears. There, there is that intimidation factor, but you have to treat people like people. And, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, we have to do the ugly things that people don't want to know about. We have mm -hmm. to arrest mm -hmm. people. We have to fight people. We have to do things like that to keep the community safe. And we're willing to do that. We're willing to risk mm -hmm. our lives. We're willing to get mm -hmm. injured to do that. And if you understand that that's what it's about and that I can't do it alone, I have to do it in conjunction with your help. It's a community policing effort. It's not Absolutely. the cops going out there and doing that. And if you realize that, then us working together gets a lot of things accomplished. Yeah. Terry, was Chicago, when I think of Chicago and police, I think it, it must be one of the tougher places to police. Did you feel that way? Well, un unfortunately, I didn't get to police in Chicago. I policed in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. Not as big a city as Chicago. Okay, but, so. But a good-sized city. Um, you know, I mean, my grandfather was, like I said, he was a Chicago police officer here in the United States when Prohibition, uh, you know, when alcohol <laughs> was outlawed in the United States. You know, during the He would have the had stories. Depression. Oh, oh, oh. My, I didn't really know him. He died when I was young, but my grandmother lived until I was in college. And she used to tell me some stories. of the stories uh, about it. He was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun, taking mm -hmm. a homicide suspect mm -hmm. back to the lockup. And that's another reason my father was apprehensive about me going into that, yes. that line of work. He remembered, my dad was an infant, but he remembered the stories my grandmother told of that yeah. knock on the door of, you know, Mrs. Yeah, Tucker that's... grabbing his son come with us, your husband's been shot. And I mean, let's face it, trauma medicine in 1933 when my grandfather got shot is a whole lot not... different than trauma medicine in 2023. So yeah. there, there were a lot of reasons my dad didn't want me to do this. Yeah, yeah. Terry, I want to just go briefly back to this um, this cancer battle of yours. It, it's about 10 years now that you've been, um, you're, you're still alive, you're still doing what you do, you're still being um, a wonderful, gorgeous human being. I just wanted to for you to share with the audience um, how you make it through some of those tougher times and how you prepare yourself and your family for those conversations around death and dying. Yeah, I, I, I talk about what really has gotten me through this. Um, and, and, and I know we're probably going to talk about the, the four truths here in a minute. Yeah. But the other thing that I, I think has got me through this is what I call my three F's. And those stand for faith, family and friends. I've had a I have always had a very strong belief, very strong faith in God. Um, when I was on interferon for those five years, I always say there's there's a big difference between living and not dying. And, and I felt like I was in that not dying phase that I really wasn't living. I was just trying to hang on day to day. And there got to a point where I was really like, OK, God, th this isn't living. You know, please just take me, get me out of here. Yeah. But he did. But he did give me the strength, I believe, to, to continue to move forward. So the faith, that's the faith aspect. The family aspect, I said, you know, it's my wife and daughter. And 
I remember when I had my leg amputated, my doctor wanted to put me on chemotherapy. And I looked at him and I said, is it, is it going to save my life? And he kind of shook his head and said, no, but it'll probably buy you some more time. And I was eight years into this fight. And I was like, well, if the outcome's going to be the same, I'm not sure I want to, I want to go through this, but I'll go home and talk to my family. And this really is kind of a funny story. It, it, it did happen this <laughs> yes, way. Yes, go, go. So I, I, I go in, you know, and I, I start telling my wife and daughter about what's going on. And my daughter's immediately, all right, we need a family meeting. I'm like, family meeting? There's three of us. It's not like we got a board here or something <laughs> like that, you know? So, so we end up sitting around the kitchen table and individually talking about how we feel about me having chemotherapy. And then when that's finished, my daughter's like, all right, let's take a vote. How many people want dad to have chemotherapy? And my wife and daughter raised their hand. I'm like, wait a minute, am I getting outvoted for something that I don't want to do? But I remember back when I was in the police academy and our defensive tactics used to have us bring a photograph of the people we love the most to class. And as we were learning to defend ourselves, we were to look at that photograph because he reasoned you will fight harder for the people you love than you will fight for yourself. So I ended up taking chemotherapy, not because I wanted to, but because I love my family more than I love myself. And in hindsight, it was the correct thing to do. It was a bridge that got me to the, to the trial drug that I'm on now. Yes. And then I guess the last, the last F is friends. And I think when you get a chronic or a terminal illness, mm -hmm. you realize who are really going to be in the foxhole with you, you know, the people that are going to be there for you. And I was actually kind of surprised. People that I thought would be there for me yes. weren't. And people that I thought would never be there. Yeah, mm. exactly. You know, all of a sudden are there for me and are there for me all the time. So, you know, count on your friends, but at the same time, don't count out the people that you don't think are going to be there for you because yeah. they just might surprise you. Mm. Terry, just reflecting on 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 your journey with cancer and understanding from that nursing medical perspective, I'm so glad that in this day and age we get to have those conversations and you get the choice. So back when I was nursing, it was just you did uh, what the doctors suggested and that was often chemo and, and chemo is not fun. It is not a pleasant process. Um, and I'm really glad to hear that you could have those conversations with your family and with your permission. I just um, one of the before we go on to what you do now, which is incredibly important on that last tough process. Have you talked to the family about what you're passing and what that might look like and what your wishes are in or around that time? I have actually. I, I have. Uh, I planned my funeral uh, when when I had my my leg amputated. I went with my wife to the mortuary, to the cemetery, yes. and to the church. And I I planned my funeral because I've been there when I've you know you you invest so much time, so much energy into someone dying. I mean, it's a process, yes. and yes. when somebody dies, you're exhausted. And now you, oh my gosh, I got to go to the funeral home and, you know, arrange those services. And I've got to go to the church and arrange that service. And I got to go to the cemetery and, you know, buy a plot or, you know, a mausoleum or whatever you end up just mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. And it's exhausting. And oh, so I, I just felt that it, this was an opportunity. This was, I guess, one final gift, if you want to call it that, to oh. give to my family. Where when I die, you make one phone call and it's all taken care of and you can be together as a family and grieve and, you know, whatever. Tell funny stories about me, whatever you want to do, you know, yeah, when it's over. Yeah, yeah. You know, we all are going to die, but yes. we're not all really going to live. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the great thing about death. We all get it once. Dying, so, you know, with, dying with dignity and dying in the way that is... Um, almost transformative so I've recently had the same conversations with my husband and kids and I'm like do not have a funeral I just want to be cremated I want you to go to a restaurant I want to have a, the best meal you've ever had and tell funny stories I want a celebration I actually think that getting through life um is a celebration Terry and for you particularly and all the adversity that you've worked through that should be a celebration of Terry. You know, that should be uplifting and transformative for all of those amazing people in and around you. 
Um, and I'm so glad that you're open to having this conversation because I know that there will be someone in the audience that is struggling with those concepts and what you've just said will help them in their day, which actually brings me back to what you do now, which is really powerful. Tell me about Motivational Check and the four truths that you come up with. So Motivational Check is a, is a term. It goes back to my police academy days mm -hmm. when our defensive tactics instructor gave us that phrase, Motivational Check, yeah. that if we were just having a tough day, you know, I, oh, I can't get through this. I mean, we did a lot of uh, physical things in the academy, running, push-ups, mm -hmm. things like that. And yeah. I mean, let's face it, you know, there are certain days where, hey, I'm feeling great and this is okay. <laughs> and there are other days when, oh man, I'm, it's just a struggle. So he gave us that phrase that we could yell out when, whenever we felt, you know, I'm having a tough time. And the rest of our class, our academy class would respond. We were the 84th recruit class in the Cincinnati mm -hmm. Police Academy with a loud 84. Just to let that person know that, hey, you're not alone. We're all struggling, but we're all going to get through this together. So when I was looking for a title for my company eventually, yes. when I started out as just having a blog, yes. I thought motivational check would be would be a good title for it. And, and that's really kind of gotten me to what I call my four truths. And, and I'll give them to you. I, I have them on a yes, post-it note please. <laughs> in my office. And I, and I see them every day. So they constantly yes. get reinforced in my mind. Yes. The first one is this. You need to control your mind or your mind is going to control you. The second one is embrace the pain and the difficulty that we all experience in life and use that pain and difficulty to make you a stronger and more resilient individual. The third one is more of a legacy type of truth. And it's this, what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. Mm, that's and then beautiful. the fourth one I feel is pretty self-explanatory. As long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And I call those kind of the bedrock of my soul. They're just a, yes. they're just a good place to build a quality of life off of. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing those. Um, the book, I want to know what was the catalyst that made you think, oh, I'm going to write a book. And the book is um, Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life, which you, Terry, are all of those things. But Thank what you. was the, why write a book? It's different for everyone. The, the reasons that people write are different. So I want to know yours, Terry. So the book was really born out of two conversations I had. Mm -hmm. One was with a former player that I had coached in high school. Yes. Uh, my wife and I live in Colorado now, and she had moved here with her fiance. And the four of us had dinner one night. And I remember saying to her after dinner that I was really excited that she was living close and I could watch her find and live her purpose. Oh. And she got real quiet for a while. And she looked at me and she said, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth using your unique gifts and talents and living that reason. So that was one conversation. And then I had a young man in college who reached out to me on social media and he asked me what I thought were the most important things that he should learn to not just be successful in his job or in business, but to be successful in life. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to give him the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others. You know, not yeah. that those yeah. are important. Those are incredibly important. But I wanted yes. to see if I could go deeper with him. So I spent some time and I was taking notes and eventually kind of had these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles. And then I sent them to him. And then I sort of stepped back and I was like, you know, I got a life story that fits underneath this principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates that principle. So literally during the three to four month period where I was healing after I had my leg amputated, I sat down at the computer every day and I built stories and they're real stories about real people underneath each of the principles and that's how sustainable excellence came to be wow well done um terry you've got a special gift for the audience today do you want to tell them what that is sure if you uh, if you go to motivationalcheck.com which is my blog and you leave me your email i will send you a, a downloadable copy a free downloadable copy of my book wow what a gift audience um 
I'm so glad that I've gotten to speak to you today, Terry. Um, a couple of uh, the next question is 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 going to be a tough one. So, where do you see yourself in five years? What's I hope your in vision? heaven. <laughs> I, I really do, and 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 that's not. And I knew that that would be your answer, and, and yeah. I routinely ask this of my interviewees, and I know that that would be your answer, and I actually think it's still important to ask. Yeah, it, it is. It, it it really is. You know, I I remember I heard a Native American. You you talked about the indigenous people in Australia. Mm. I, these are the in, indigenous people here in the United States. Um, I, I heard a, a a saying that they had, and it went like this. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking oh, for. Don't get me wrong. Not looking to hasten my demise in any no, way. No, I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna qualify this as you're not intending to hasten things, no, but no, you, not at all. But is... death is not nearly as scary for me because I believe I live the purposes for which I was put on this earth to do. Wow. That's really powerful stuff, Terry. Um, I'm wanting to, to know if the audience is listening to this interview and they just want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah. It, just reach out to me on my blog, motivationalcheck.com. I, I put up a thought for the day every day on the blog where, and with that comes a question about maybe how you could apply the thought into your life. I have recommendations for and books. And that's daily, Terry? That's daily? Yeah, YouTube. daily. I do that seven days a week. As long as I'm not in the hospital, I will absolutely do it. <laughs> but yes, I There's put it that. up seven days. Yeah, seven days a week. And you can also leave me a message there. And if, if you leave me a message, like I said, I'll, I'll send you a copy of my book. Or if you just want to connect, I'd be more than happy to do that as well. Terry, thank you so much for that gift and for being so vulnerable with me in this interview. I really appreciate the fact that you can talk so openly about all the stuff that's gone on. Now, knowing you live in Colorado, one final question, how yeah. much snow is there? Uh, today it's uh, sunny and 50 degrees, so not a whole lot. <laughs> okay, so I'm an Australian. We don't see very much snow and I love snow. And so I I know Colorado is, you know, pretty famous for its snow. So, yeah. Yeah. and it, it's what? It's beautiful here. Yes, I've heard that it's incredibly beautiful. What a beautiful place to operate from life. Um, can you tell us what's next? You, any more books in that amazing brain of yours? You know, I'm thinking about a second book. You know, Sustainable oh. Excellence is a book about success. Yes. And I think I would like to write another book also about a word that starts with S, and that's significance. You know, success is what we do for ourselves. You know, we are successful in, you know, business, podcasting, whatever we end up doing. Yeah. Significance is what we do for other people. And, yes. and I think you can be both. I think you can be successful yes. and significant. I agree. So I, I guess I'm, I'm, I haven't started writing. I'm just sort of toying around with, you know, in my brain. I've been toying around for a long time. So if I'm going to do it, I better get off the dime and start bit, doing it. You've had a bit on your plate, Terry. Let's just, you know, you've had a bit on your plate. So that's just a little okay. bit. I just, knowing that you've written this and the first book is amazing, I, I it just, I thought, oh, I wonder if you're going to write another one. That would be so good because after each book, your perspective shifts and changes a little. And so the second book is a little a little different and comes from a little bit different perspective. So um, I just thought maybe you, you might write another book that would be a wonderful legacy to leave for the world and also for your family and your daughter. It is. And I have written other things. I actually, when I was a police officer, I used to write letters to my daughter you know, if the unthinkable would happen, just, you know, here are things I want for you. Here are things that I remember growing up, things like that. And I, I thought about publishing it, but I, I actually gave it to her for Christmas. I, it, it's, I, it's probably been finished for 20 years, but it, it was, you know, it's your book. You, you decide what you, if you want to just keep it for yourself, oh, gosh, that's great. I, yeah. If I, you want to add something to it and publish it, that that's up to you, whatever you want to do, but it's, it's hers for now. Yeah, Terry, I, I was just thinking about the power of 
um, inspiring. Um, there's a whole range of things in there. There's the father daughter relationship. There's, there's the policing component. There's the, you know, um, that would be a powerful book if your daughter ever decided to write and write her perspective in receiving those letters and how important they were in her life, um, would be a, a powerful legacy, but, um, absolutely her choice and, and, what she wants to do will will be her choice um so she's enjoying what she does now terry i'm assuming she is actually she got married uh a year ago it was it was one of my big goals in life to, to i have a prosthetic leg to use my prosthetic leg to walk ah, her down the aisle which i was and, able to do um which was an interesting experience because she was so nervous she, yes. she had our arms locked and she, she started to pull me and I was like, don't pull me. I'll fall down, you know, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but it was a great experience. She, she's married to another uh, individual. He's in the air force. He's a pilot. And wow. the two of them live in Florida now. Yes, and uh, yes. we are just incredibly proud of, of both of them and everything that they have accomplished. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. I'm just thinking of your prosthetic leg and thinking about the bionics, when we were talking before about the advances in cancer management, there's also huge advances in prosthetics in terms of fingers and feet and legs and arms and incredible things happening in that space, um, which is great, again, for humanity, isn't it? It, it really is. I mean, my leg is really kind of amazing. It, it has a, mm -hmm. a microprocessor built oh. into the knee. I, I wow. plug it in at night. Wow. It, has a, it has a gyroscope in the in the calf, yeah. so it knows <laughs> whether I'm you know in front of it or whether oh. I'm behind it, and yes. it reacts accordingly. I can use my phone to to set it to you know if I want to ride an exercise bike or if I want to play golf it has that's different amazing. settings yeah it, it, it's it's an incredible piece of equipment incredible see like my always seeing the positive side of life I'm like wow if you had to have your leg amputated what a great gift to be able to play with effectively but that enables you to move around, Terry. What a gift. Oh, it, it's, it's a, you know, I mean, you, I'm six foot eight and, and you can imagine how tall my wife's five foot five. So when, when she puts it up next to her, it kind of comes up to her shoulder, you know, it, it, it we, we kind of laugh at it sometimes, but it's, it's an amazing piece of equipment and I'm, I feel very fortunate to have it. Oh, amazing, Terry. Look, Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm incredibly grateful for your time, um, incredibly gracious for what you've imparted to the audience today. And I just want to say in finals, um, thank you so much for reaching out. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I encourage the audience to just reach out and say hi to Terry. He's got such a wealth of knowledge and understanding in that amazing head of his. And I want to wish you all the very best for the future. I hope we get to talk again. I hope we get to talk about the next book. That would be amazing. But for us today, that we're out of time, unfortunately. Terry Tucker, thank you for coming on the Everyday Business Show. Um, we wish you all the best and um, hope that shows with business owners that puts them in front of a global audience and in behind those shows is a whole range of things from digital magazines to social media to blogging to email to lead generation just a whole range of things